Io son colui che tenne ambo le chiavi del cor di Federigo e che le volsi, serrando e disserrando, sì soavi, che dal secreto suo quasi ogni uomo tolsi, fede portai al glorioso uffizio, tanto che ne perde i sogni e polsi. This is how Pierre de Levigne introduces himself to Dante and Virgil, who walk through the wood of suicide, suicides, Inferno 13, lines 58 through 63. Pierre de la Vigna, or de la Vigne, or Petrus de Vinea, de Vineis, was born in Capua near Naples in southern Italy in 1190 to a family of humble social status. In his youth in Capua, he attended the school of Ars Dictaminis, a school of rhetoric where students learned how to write according to the style of the papal chancery. And then he studied law at the University of Bologna in northern Italy, the first university founded in the Western world. In 1220, Pierre was appointed notary and chancellor at the Magna Curia, the Sicilian court of Frederick II, King of Sicily, and the, and the Holy Roman Emperor. Pierre made a very quick career progression and was a nominated judge of the Magna Curia in 1225, chancellor of the Imperial Court uh, in 1239, and in 1247, Logothete, a senior administrative title from the Byzantine tradition corresponding to that of a secretary of state and then Protonotary, the chief of the court of law of the Magna Curia. Pierre contributed to the composition of the Liber Augustalis, literally the book of the August One, or the book of the emperor published in Melfi in 1231, a collection of 200 laws called the Constitutions of the Kingdom of Sicily that was considered the most advanced code of laws produced by a secular power during the Middle Ages. Pierre was indeed the king's prime minister and his first counselor. He was the king's alter ego and his voice and pen writing all of his official correspondence and administering justice for him for almost 30 years. What kind of ruler was Frederick II of whom as Dante puts it, Pierre held both the keys to his heart and at whose court he served all his life. Frederick II, Stupor Mundi, or the wonder of the world as he was defined, belonged to the German Hohenstaufen dynasty of Swabia. His paternal and maternal grandparents were respectively the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa and the Norman King of Sicily, Roger II Altavilla. And his parents were uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI and the Queen of Sicily, Costanzo d'Altavilla. Frederick thus reunited under his rule the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Sicily, Calabria, and Apulia. He was born in Iesi in central Italy in 1194, and since both his parents died when he was very young, he was entrusted to Pope Innocent III, born Notario de Conti di Segni um, between 1198 and 1216, um, as his guardian. Frederick II was King of Sicily from 1198 onwards, King of Germany since uh, 1215, Holy Roman Emperor crowned in Rome by Pope Honorius III on November 22nd, 1220, and finally King of Jerusalem from 1229. He married four times and had several children. Among them, uh, his natural son Manfred, who in 1266 was defeated and killed by Charles of Anjou in the Battle of Benevento, causing the Kingdom of Sicily to be ruled by the French dynasty. Frederick's Magna Curia was the political, administrative, and ju judicial uh, center of the Kingdom of Sicily. His Liber Augustalis, we were referring to before, written together with Pierre de Levigne, while stemming from Emperor Justinian's sixth century code of laws, was also influenced by canon law and common medieval practice and customs. Therefore, it was one of the most advanced codes up until that time. It reflected the kingdom's composite society and responded to its practical needs. Some of the laws protected the citizens of the kingdom, no matter what their nationality and religion was. At the same time, it was based on a strong central idea according to which the power of the sovereign emanated directly from God. And the role of the king and his ministers was that of administering God's justice so that opposing the king's laws was considered sacrilege. Frederick's court gathered together an eclectic elite of intellectuals. There were Normans, Germans, Romans, Provencals, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, 
speaking and writing a number of different languages, who cultivated the sciences, philosophy, and poetry. Both the king and most of his ministers, including Pierre, composed poetry in Sicilian dialect, importing the Provencal tradition of lyric poetry, mainly love poetry, into Italy and into an Italian vernacular. Some of the traditional poetic meters, like the sonnet, were invented by these poets. This was, in fact, the birth of the Italian literary tradition. Thus, poets of the following generation would copy down the Sicilian poetry composed by Frederick's entourage, translating it into the Tuscan vernacular language. Dante's own poetic genius was rooted in this tradition. Already in his treatise on vernacular language and poetry written in Latin in 1303-1304, Dante gave a portrait of the linguistic and poetic flourishing at the Magna Curia, and the comedy can also be read as a literary journey across this tradition and a quest for a new kind of poetry, which would be able to express much more complex content. And yet Dante places Frederick in the city of this as a heretic and Pierre in Canto 13 in the wood of suicides as a suicide. We will consider in our discussion Dante's point of view on Pierre's sin and punishment, but what are the historical uh, facts? In 1249, Pierre was accused by probably envious courtiers and Dante's contempt of envy uh, as one of the roots of all evils is a theme throughout the poem of betraying Frederick's secrets and reporting them to the Pope. Most historians contemporary to Pierre regarded this accusation as Lander and Dante as well in Inferno 13 has Pierre declared his faith to Frederick and his own innocence. Imprisoned and blinded, Pierre killed himself banging his head against the walls of his cell. On the one hand, Dante recognizes the stature of Pierre and exonerates him of the charge of treason and identifies with his tragedy. Yet he punishes Pierre in hell. We can still admire a bust of Pierre de Levigne in the Civic Museum of Capua, Pierre's hometown, and perceive and be moved by his noble dignity.